We have so much to learn. And um, I'm going to talk to you about um, some things that we do know, but the, the bulk of, of what I want to talk about are, is hypothetical. It's things that we don't know. And that departure is going to be fairly sudden and fairly abrupt for you as I go through this. But there is a reason that I want to do this. I'm going to talk first about systemic mastocytosis. And the reason that I'm going to talk about that is a lot of people come to see me who have what may be mast cell activation syndrome, but they come in thinking that they have mastocytosis. And they've read about it online, and then there's some overlap with the symptomatology, but they're very, very, very different conditions. And I would venture to guess that not a one of you in, the, in this room has systemic mastocytosis. So, but it does inform how we approach things from a diagnostic and therapeutic background. And um, I think in that respect, it's helpful. And I think it's also helpful if I start talking about mastocytosis, because that gives you a paradigm that we do understand and that we move away from that and uh, talk about how mast cell activation syndrome is very different than that. So what I'm going to do is, for those who aren't really acquainted, we, the feedback's nasty, huh? Um, maybe we could turn the volume down a bit. Um, for those who aren't familiar with what mast cells are and why we focus on them, Hands up if you can't hear me. <laughs> All right, everyone good at the back? Yeah? Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk first about what mast cells are, what their function is, what happens when things go wrong with mast cells. I'm going to talk about the clinical manifestations when mast cells are activated. And then we'll talk about the spectrum of mast cell activation disorders which are not the same as, that's not synonymous with mast cell activation syndrome. And then finally, I want to talk about the relationship between mast cell activation syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and POTS. So let me, I'm not going to go through this, but what I do want to impress on you is that the immune system is complicated. And when we talk about mast cells and what happens when mast cells are activated, we're talking about one very specific arm of the immune system. So those are called type 1 reactions. And they have no bearing at all on what happens under other circumstances at other times with the immune system. So we're looking at a very specific type of reaction when mast cells are activated. Now, why does that matter? It matters because there are only specific things that can happen when mast cells are activated. When you step on the gas in your car, it can only do one thing. It can rev the engine. It can't do anything else. And when mast cells are activated, they only have certain things that they can elicit by way of clinical symptoms within the body. And people often come in and they say, well, I've got symptoms A, B, C, and D, and they're disappointed to find out that that's not related to mast cell activation because that's not what mast cells do. So that's why it's important to understand what the mast cells look like functionally, what's inside mast cells, and what those chemicals can elicit within the body. So on your left, you see a resting mast cell. When the mass, and that resting mast cell has, you see those black round spots inside the mast cell? Those are called granules. And those granules contain a whole lot of different chemicals within them. When a mast cell is activated, it spews all those granules out from within the cell into the surrounding area. Those chemicals are released. And when they interact with various target organs or target cells, then they elicit very specific constellations of symptoms. So there are a whole bunch of mediators within mast cells, so those chemicals we call mediators. And these are some of them, but there are actually many dozens of mediators that are within mast cells. 
Everybody is familiar with histamine, but there are a whole lot of others. Now, the reason I want to show you that there's a list of, of different chemicals that come from mast cells is, if you block one chemical, and let's say we block the action of histamine with an antihistamine drug, you're not going to expect to get very much benefit because there are all those other chemicals that still remain within the mast cells like platelet activating factor, leukotrienes, and so on, that are still active. They're not opposed by any pharmaceutical that you're taking. And as a result, you're still, still going to be very highly symptomatic. So when we treat people who have any of the mast cell activation syndromes, we have to use usually a number of medicines in combination to block the various chemicals that are released or to try to stop the mast cells from becoming activated to begin with, okay? Antihistamines by themselves don't do that much. So what are the target cells and the target organs? Well, for the most, there are lots of them. But for the most part, they're skin, and they can be the blood vessels, they can be the airways, they can be the gastrointestinal tract, or they can be the uterus, the genitourinary tract. And what's common to all of those different organ systems is they all have a type of cell called a smooth muscle cell. And the smooth muscle cells in the airways and the blood vessels and the gastrointestinal tract and so on all have receptors for those various chemicals. And when the chemicals bind to the receptors, it initiates a number of events within the cells that give rise to the symptoms that we experience when we have allergic type of symptoms. And that can be itchy skin, it can be runny nose, it can be watery eyes, it can be wheezing. In cases with anaphylaxis, it can be a fall in blood pressure. So there are very specific types of interactions that occur through those receptors. And if we're really lucky, there are, block, there are drugs that can block the action of those chemicals at the level of the receptor. But that's not always the case. So what happens when those mast cells are activated and they act on those blood vessels? Well, a whole bunch of stuff can happen. The blood vessels can be leaky and fluid can escape from within the blood vessels and they can, it can cause some uh, swelling in the area of the leaky blood vessel. And you've all had mosquito bites, so you know it gets red, it gets itchy, it gets swollen, and all of that arises because of leakage of fluid from the blood vessel. If somebody has asthma, allergic asthma, their airways scrunch shut, and that's as a result of the chemicals that react with the smooth muscle in the airways. If somebody has a food allergy, then they may develop nausea, vomiting, cramps, or diarrhea because those same chemicals interact with the smooth muscle in the gastrointestinal tract, and so on. So you get the sense that there are very specific constellations of things that arise when smooth muscle cells are activated as a result of release of chemicals from within mast cells. So those are called immediate hypersensitivity type of reactions. This is a list of some of the symptoms that arise. So when you see consensus definitions of mast cell activation syndrome, and I'll go over that with you a little bit later on, those consensus definitions arise from understanding what those manifestations can be. And when somebody comes and they have symptoms that don't fall within that consensus, it's because the mast cells can't give rise to those types of symptoms. So what are the mast cell activation disorders? Well, there are basically, in the broadest sense, there's two types. There are those types that arise because the mast cells are mutated, they become wonky, and when they're dysregulated, then they release chemicals and they can cause symptoms. And that can, that can occur because of a mutation in one or another of a regulatory protein that sits on the mast cell surface. Now, when one mast cell undergoes a mutation like that and it divides, then it gives rise to two daughter mast cells that have the same mutation. And when they divide, 
then they give rise to four daughter mast cells that carry that same mutation. And when that process goes on and on, then that mutation is carried by a clone of mast cells, all of which carry that same mutation on the surface. So those are a type of condition, it's called a clonal condition, and that's what gives rise to that family of things that are called mastocytosis. But that's really different than mast cell activation syndrome, where we don't see that kind of mutation, we don't see clonal proliferation or division of mast cells that are, um, that are mutated, that are different than normal, okay? So there are those people who have mast cell activation syndrome, and that's really different than those people who have systemic mastocytosis where they carry certain types of mutations on the surface of mast cells. Now, what I want to do is I'll talk about systemic mastocytosis more for the contrast so that you'll see where things fall apart when we talk about mast cell activation syndrome, okay? So, again, the clinical presentations are very broad, they're very diverse, and they can be due to a number of things. They can be because there are too many mast cells in the body and they're mutated and they can infiltrate certain organs and they can give rise to symptoms because they start crowding the bone marrow or the liver or the GI tract, or they can give rise to symptoms because of chemicals that are released and they can, and those symptoms may not necessarily be evident all the time. There are times that things can be fairly quiescent and then things go to hell in a handbasket and people become very highly symptomatic and then things can calm down again. So with mast cell disorders, the presentation often comes early on and very often in childhood or adolescence. The difference is that when it happens in young kids, those mast cell disorders usually regress. They go away with time. So when it happens in a kid under the age of two, then it goes away over the next few years. But when it comes on somewhat later in childhood or during adolescence or during adulthood, then it does tend to persist and it tends to be lifelong. So when do we suspect an underlying mast cell disorder? I'll show you some pictures of people who have skin lesions. And those skin lesions are because they have too many mast cells in their body and those mast cells are clumped or they're aggregated in the skin. We suspect mast cell disorders when a problem arises in a child older than the age of two or if they have an enlarged liver, enlarged spleen or some other abnormalities on their blood tests. In people who have unexplained anaphylactic reactions, where we just can't get a handle on what, why they're having those symptoms, then we look towards mast cell disorders. And finally, in people, and this typically is in the 30, 40, 50 year old population who have early onset of thinning of their bones of osteoporosis, that's one of the hallmarks of mast cell disorders as well. And we'll then do a workup for mastocytosis. So, Again, I'm still sort of going through how we categorize things so that you understand when you see somebody about mast cell activation, what is it that we're thinking about when we're asking those questions of you? So the first question is, might that person have a clonal disorder where they have a mutation that gives rise to an abnormal population of mast cells? And that can give rise to anaphylaxis, but equally can give rise to what's called monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome. And that's different than the kind of mast cell activation syndrome that people who have POTS or EDS will have. Because again, those are clonal disorders. There are people who have allergies and they may have hives, they may have food allergies, they may have seasonal allergies, and they also have mast cell activation. But that's different again than the kind of mast cell activation syndrome that people with POTS or EDS might have. And then there is this third group, which right now is called idiopathic. And idiopathic means we do a whole lot of tests. We do everything that we can in as thorough a fashion as we can. We rule out a whole bunch of stuff.
and we don't have a very obvious mechanism. And we'll call that idiopathic. And people who have anaphylaxis may have anaphylaxis where we just can't get a handle on why it's happening, although we think we understand why. And the same may be true in people who have POTS or EDS. So I'll come to that in a few minutes. So again, these are in red the consensus, by the consensus guidelines that have been drafted just this past year, and it was published this past summer, and a meeting was held at the National Institutes of Health about mast cell activation syndrome. These are the consensus symptoms. I'm not gonna go through them one at a time, but I do want you to have a sense of why we ask those questions, because we're trying to nail down whether somebody has this constellation of symptoms that might point to mast cell activation, excuse me, mast cell activation as a potential problem. So the World Health Organization has revised their classification of mast cell activation disorders into the groups that are shown over here. Now these are by and large the nasty things and these are not what anybody in this room will have. But again, I want to give you a sense of where the boundaries lie between the mast cell activation syndrome and these other disorders. So there are major and minor criteria that we use for diagnosis. And the major criteria require that we do a bone marrow biopsy to see if there are clusters of mast cells abnormal numbers of mast cells in very specific locations in the bone marrow and to see whether they have abnormal shapes and abnormal staining with antibodies. And if we do molecular diagnostic testing, if we can define mutations in the regulatory proteins in the mast cell surfaces. Now, people who have mast cell activation syndrome, so again, I'm contrasting, will say, well, how come you don't want to do a bone marrow biopsy? Because the bone marrow in mast cell activation syndrome will be normal. So bone marrows are not a pleasant thing to have. Bone marrow biopsies are not pleasant. And they're non-diagnostic, so we generally try to avoid doing them unless we're looking for a specific diagnosis. So here's an example of somebody with systemic mastocytosis, a 33-year-old fellow who had symptoms beginning at the age of 17 and symptoms intensified over the course of time and he had involvement of multiple organ systems and that involvement was worsening to the extent that he was developing full-blown anaphylaxis. And it was so bad that he needed um, support by intubation to help his breathing and blood pressure. He had a bone marrow that was done and it was consistent with a diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis. And this is what his skin looks like. He's got lesions of urticaria pigmentosa, which are clusters of mast cells in the skin. And I'll show you, here's another fellow who has mastocytosis and he's got even more of the same types of lesions, but there are other types as well. So this is a close-up to show you that. Now there is um, what we call a fairly benign form of mastocytosis called indolent systemic mastocytosis. And these are people who have too many mast cells in their bone marrow, or they may have too many mast cells residing elsewhere in the gastrointestinal tract, <clears throat> excuse me, or in the liver. People typically don't have a lot of skin lesions, but the vast majority will have that mutation in the mast cell surface. Um, they don't have um, very many of those clusters of mast cells in the bone marrow, and they don't have crowding of mast cells in other tissues that might cause abnormal functioning of the tissues, but they do have a markedly elevated tryptase level, and I'll talk to you about what that means. They have a mutation in uh, this receptor called KIT, and they stain with antibodies when they shouldn't. So, and here's somebody who has even more mast cells in their skin. So, as we go up the ladder, we get to nastier and nastier and more aggressive conditions, and 
Um, those are easy to detect by doing the appropriate tests. And then um, there are some people who are very highly symptomatic and they have sweating and bone pain and poor appetite and weight loss and abnormal organ system function and falls in hemoglobin and white blood cells. So again, those are mastocytosis related features. So the kinds of tests that we do for systemic mastocytosis actually are very similar to the types of tests that we do for mast cell activation syndrome because we're dealing with the same cell type. And these are the tests that we used to do when we could still get them done in Ontario, but we can't get all these tests done any longer. So um, now we're down to just getting a serum tryptase level. Now, tryptase is an enzyme that comes from mast cells. And in people who have mastocytosis, they have very high tryptase levels in the order of way over 20 to several hundred. In people who have mast cell activation syndrome, people will have normal tryptase levels because tryptase is a reflection of the numbers of mast cells in the body. And in people who have mast cell activation syndrome, the mast cell numbers are normal, but they're activated. So I hope you understand the difference. So tryptase will be normal in somebody with mast cell activation syndrome, especially when they're not very highly symptomatic. So what we'll then do is we'll get a baseline tryptase level when somebody's feeling relatively okay, and then I'll give them another requisition to repeat their tryptase level when they have those symptoms that I showed you right at the beginning that are referable to mast cell activation. And I'll ask them to repeat that tryptase level when they're really symptomatic. And then what we're gonna look for is a significant rise in tryptase in the blood. And a significant rise is defined as an increase of 20% over baseline plus two. So, for example, if somebody starts, and I'll do this quickly in my mind, if they, the upper range of normal is 11.4, if they start at 4.0, which is normal, then 4 plus 20 percent is 4.8, plus another 2 is 6.8. So that's still within the reference range because the upper limit is 11.4, but it's still considered a significant increase when somebody is highly symptomatic. So that's the tool that we're left with now since the Ministry of Health stopped funding all of the other tests that we used to do that we can no longer get. So, but it is a very reliable test. Now there are some people who come from a family where their tryptase levels are very high all the time. And that was shown a couple of years ago by a group at the National Institutes of Health. It was shown that those families have extra genes, sometimes duplication of the gene, sometimes triplication of the gene, that codes for the tryptase enzyme. So they're running high levels all the time, and if we test their parents or siblings, then their parents and siblings will also be running high levels of tryptase all the time. And what was interesting in this particular paper by John Lyons and Josh Milner was that not only did these people have elevated tryptase, but they had some other things, which when you look at, you say, well, that's kind of interesting because it speaks to a lot of the symptoms that some of you may have. They have joint hypermobility, they have autonomic dysfunction, they have flushing, itching hives, and so forth. So in other words, the population who has familial increases in alpha tryptase seems to have a high likelihood of also having EDS and a high likelihood perhaps of having dysautonomia of some sort. So again, to circle back around to the consensus criteria, there are three criteria that we need to fulfill in order to be able to, with some certainty, make a diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome. One of the criteria is to have the appropriate symptoms. So if somebody has the appropriate symptoms, then we'll check that off. The second criterion is to demonstrate an elevated marker of mast cell activation. And that was the elevation in tryptase when somebody is highly symptomatic. Uh, 
And then criteria number three is to demonstrate a good therapeutic response to medications that interfere with chemicals that are released from mast cells or a good therapeutic response to chemicals that block mast cells from releasing chemicals. So in other words, mast cell stabilizers. So those three criteria can be seen in people who have systemic mastocytosis. And that's where the confusion arises because people will look at the Mastocytosis Society website where it lists those symptoms and they'll say, aha, that's me. I must have systemic mastocytosis. But that's not the case because there are other reasons that somebody can have the exact same symptoms and they can be because they have allergic reactions for a host of other reasons or they can have that form of idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome that can be related to POTS or EDS. So that brings me around to idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome. And that really is the thing that we're trying to tease apart here um, in my clinic and what we're trying to come to understand in terms of its relationship with EDS and POTS. So here's an example of somebody with mast cell activation syndrome which is, I chose this for a reason, it's a little bit atypical, and the atypical part is the first line. It's a 43-year-old male, whereas most people who have mast cell activation syndrome are female. And I'll talk about why that is. They have a background of asthma, some acid reflux, and a variety of other things that doesn't really bear on this. And they come with itchy skin, hives, flushing, some swelling, nausea, vomiting, cramps, diarrhea, and lightheadedness. You say, okay, that's all, those are all legitimate symptoms that we can attribute to mast cell activation. They've tried chromalin and it was helpful, but they didn't get on very well with some of the other medications that we tried. The serum tryptase level was increased, the upper limit of normal is 11.4, they were at 14. And bone marrow biopsy, skin biopsy, colonic biopsies were all negative. So this is somebody who has familial alpha hypertryptasemia, which is that condition that runs in families that's related to EDS and POTS. So when we have somebody like that, what can we do? Well, the first thing is, we say, look, there are some things that we know that will activate mast cells in normal, healthy individuals, in people who have mastocytosis, and in people who have mast cell activation syndrome. So we're going to advise that people, as best they can, try to avoid those things that are known to activate mast cells. Second thing that we do is use medications. And those medications fall into different classes. There are those medications like antihistamines of different categories that block histamine receptors. There are medicines like aspirin that will block an enzyme that converts um, a precursor into an active product that gives rise to flushing. And then there are mast cell stabilizers. And those mast cell stabilizers are intended to prevent mast cells from becoming activated in the first place. So those medicines are usually given in, um, in a regimen in which several medications are given because none of them in and of themselves are all that effective. And I'm gonna tell you that my aim is not to put people on a whole bunch of medications. That's not what I wanna do. I wanna have people on the fewest medications they can be on at the lowest effective dose that will get them by, but what you're seeing is a limitation of the effectiveness of the medications, and it's for that reason that we have to use a number of them together in order to achieve the symptomatic improvement that we're hoping to see. So these are, again, it's a reiteration of the kinds of medications that we use to treat. So um, a number of years ago, we um, published uh, an abstract that looked at mast cell activation syndrome in conjunction with POTS and in conjunction with hypermobile EDS. 
And um, I think as time has gone on, then we've seen more and more people who fall into that category. And I was talking with Dr. Guzman just a short while ago before um, we started the afternoon session, trying to understand what there is that's common to people who have POTS and who may have mast cell activation syndrome. And I'm going to um, share with you my thoughts as a clinical immunologist as to what might be going on. It's far from certain that that is what's going on, but um, this is right now what we're trying to probe. So um, the cause of mast cell activation syndrome is not known. That's what idiopathic means. But let me put to you a few observations. People who have POTS, which is a common correlate of mast cell activation, are for the most part female. Now the reason I emphasize that is autoimmune disorders occur for the most part in women. Women, for reasons that are not entirely clear, are much more prone to developing autoimmune conditions than men are. So when we look at people who have POTS, then we can demonstrate a whole bunch of markers of autoimmunity. Anti-nuclear antibody, anti-phospholipid antibody, a type of thyroid disorder that's caused by antibodies, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, common variable immunodeficiency. If you look to the right of those conditions where it says OR, that stands for odds ratio, and if there is no increased risk, the odds ratio is 1.0. In numbers that are above 1.0, that means that people who have POTS will have an increased likelihood of developing those conditions. So if we look at Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, people with POTS will be six times more prone than the average person at developing that thyroid disorder. People who have POTS will be about 500 times more likely to have a problem with their immune system than the average person will. So there's a very strong trend towards autoimmunity in people who have POTS. And there are a bunch of other antibodies that are relevant to dysautonomia that are seen in people with POTS. And I'll, I'll ask you to direct those questions to Dr. Guzman, who really understands this, not me. But, you know, again, as an immunologist, I find it um, not only interesting, but informative that there's this strong predisposition to developing antibodies in people who have POTS. And then when we look at the flip side, if we treat people with POTS with immunomodulatory drugs, like intravenous immunoglobulin or a drug called rituximab, which is a chemotherapeutic drug, then they can show improvement. And then there are other modalities of treatment like plasma exchange that are also effective in treating the autoimmune part of POTS in those people who have it. Well, what about EDS? Is there any evidence of autoimmunity there? And the answer is yes. People will be much more likely to have celiac disease or eosinophilic esophagitis. And again, you see that the risk of having those conditions is very much higher than in the general population. So the other pearl that I want to leave you with is people who have one type of autoimmune condition are more prone to developing another type of autoimmune condition. So it's for that reason that we're looking to that patient population who is known to have autoimmunity and ask, is it possible that mast cell activation syndrome is an autoimmune condition? And that's what we're looking at right now in conjunction with some collaborators, especially those at SickKids, to see whether we can probe for activating antibodies that are directed against mast cell proteins that make mast cells turn on and release those chemicals that give rise to the kinds of conditions that you saw before. So basically, let me come back full circle and talk to you about how these conditions differ. Systemic mastocytosis. Mutations in regulatory proteins give rise to an abnormal clone of mast cells that may be activated that give rise to a whole bunch of symptoms. 
Mast cell activation syndrome has nothing to do with mutations, nothing to do with abnormal clones, but has to do with abnormal or aberrant activation of mast cells that otherwise are normal. And, and that kind of activation is seen specifically in people who have POTS or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And the question is, is there an autoimmune basis for that? So right now the treatment is still symptomatic, but if it should turn out that mast cell activation syndrome truly is autoimmune, then everything changes because we don't treat other autoimmune conditions like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis symptomatically any longer. We treat with immunomodulatory drugs that are very highly effective. And if that turns out to be the case with mast cell activation syndrome, then again, the treatment would be drastically different. We would be looking at immunomodulators as opposed to uh, medications that simply treat the symptoms. So um, in our group, are Dr. Guzman, Scott Walsh at Sunnybrook, Dr. Mendoza, and Dr. Grunbaum at SickKids. And we're looking specifically at those patients who may have an autoimmune basis to mast cell activation syndrome. So I run a few minutes over time, but thanks very much for your attention.